All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Washoe County Library System's program, um, Patterns in the Night Sky, with our star guide for the evening, Tony from Tahoe Star Tours. My name is Amanda, and I am a librarian at the Incline Village Library. This event is recorded live here in Zoom. Welcome, everyone. And we're also streaming live on the library's Facebook page. So welcome, Facebook land. Um, some quick basic housekeeping for those of you on Zoom and for you on Facebook. Mics will be muted and video is turned off. You get to see us, but unfortunately we can't see you, but we'll trust that you're out there. And a question and answer will follow in the presentation. So if you have any questions, please post them um, in the chat. If you're on Facebook or Zoom, use that chat feature and shoot us questions so Tony can answer them. And if you are joining us, uh, oh, sorry, um, put your, if you're joining us on Facebook, put your comments on the Facebook um, in the chat box there. All right, and before we get started, I do want to give a huge thank you to the friends of the Washoe County Library whose support makes events like this possible. So Tony, the universe is yours. Take it away. All right. Hey, you know, first off, I'd like to thank you guys for making this uh, possible. Uh, normally, this time of year, actually, I'm rather busy out underneath the starry skies with, uh, with guests and telescopes and lasers and whatever, and, um, you know, showing the night sky at uh, North Star at the Dark Sky Cosmarium. Uh, in fact, uh, over the last 10 years, we've had about 24,000 people up there with, uh, with me underneath the night skies, and then also, uh, you know, some of our crew from the university uh, as well operate in the telescopes. But uh, anyway, so I'm Tony Berenson. I'm uh, owner of a company called Tahoe Star Tours. And um, a little background on that. When I first started the company in 2008, uh, you know, we did, started developing a web presence. And the, the first hits that we got on the web, honestly, were people that were inquiring on how do you get onto the bus to go around and see all the stars homes uh, around Lake Tahoe. And um, that took a little while to get, to get rid of. But uh, as I mentioned, we've had a lot of people out underneath the stars. Um, uh, my passion started when I was eight years old. My uh, parents gave me a telescope. It was a small little three inch Newtonian refractor. And um, I just fell in love with that little scope. You know, I, honestly, it really opened uh, my mind to um, uh, asking questions about the universe. And in fact, my first memory of seeing stars was through the eyepiece of that little telescope. And I can remember after my uh, nighttime observing session uh, by myself out behind the house, uh, I went in and I, I told my dad, I go, gosh, you know, the stars are so cool. But, you know, they're not staying still, they're moving. And the telescope I had didn't have a motor to track the stars. And so uh, he said, well, that's, that's because the Earth is rotating on its axis. And so it was learning experience from, uh, from the get-go. So uh, I'd like to throw something out at you. I'm also a poet. And uh, I write poetry called uh, Poastromy for my presentations. And uh, I'm going to throw one out at you that's called Elders. And uh, I want you to think a little bit about what Elders is, is saying after I finish the poem and maybe take that out with you uh, tonight after the talk and, and look at the stars. But uh, I uh, was inspired to write this poem. Uh, walking out in the darkness of North Star at night and stars were twinkling off and on as they were going through the evergreen branches. So it was called Elders. I have, from time to time, walked amongst the pine, not by warmth of soul, but lights of old, those twinkling points up there. I see them every year like elders overlooking. And yes, I know how we are. To put in groups, lay boundaries as to say, they may wander ever stray. But a hundred of our lives will barely catch a million miles. So I let them out of bounds while I walk amongst the pine. I call them by their single names. Sometimes I play an elder's game. 
I'll block their sight with a single limb and let them see when I move again. And so think about that just a little bit uh, while we're here. Um, here's a field of stars um, in the night sky in, from any hemisphere on, on the planet. You can see in really, really dark skies over a couple thousand stars, maybe around 2,500 stars. Um, that's a lot of stars up there. And just, just think about the fact that those stars are so far out there that they are just single points of light in the night sky. And think about this, that um, thousands of years ago, um, when the Babylonians uh, first started recording uh, some of the um, early stories of the sky, what I call humanity in the sky or whatever, they just thought about these stars up there as single points of light. Um, there was some difference in the, in the points of light. There were actually five of them that moved, and those are called planets, and uh, planet means um, wandering star. But all the rest of them, just single points of light, they had no idea if some of them were bigger or smaller or closer or farther away. But what they did do, they did something like what we do when we're first born and we first look at our parents' faces and we start patterning. And so we develop a pattern that's recognizable of maybe our mother's face, just like this little infant here. And we carry that on um, our whole life, really, and start patterning things. When we get older and we're adults, you know, we might see a picture of a, a mound of dirt on Mars. And because of the shadows and whatever, um, it looks to us like a face on Mars. And it can be so compelling that people will maybe believe that, wow, this is a face on Mars. There must have been Martians that left that temple, that kind of thing. So there are patterns uh, that we live our life by, that we understand the world by, that um, you know, help us um, organize our directions, let's say, in the night sky. We call those constellations and asterisms. Um, constellations, um, I'll get into that in just a minute, um, are um, recognized um, areas of the night sky and recognized shapes. And then asterisms are shapes, but they're not recognized as constellations. Um, so anyways, um, as we get older, like I mentioned, uh, we might start doing what's called patternicity. And uh, patternicity is um, the ability to um, make patterns out of um, meaningless noise. And what that means is just, you know, let's say you've got a sprinkling of stars up in the sky and you can connect those and make a shape. You can lay down on the grass in the summer and look at cumulus clouds up there and you can turn the clouds into uh, a giraffe, a whale, an airplane. And uh, that's what patternicity is. Um, I actually experience a little patternicity when I go out walking the dogs behind my house. There's a little mountain here that actually is a fun little hike to go to the top of. We're only seeing the peak of it. But on the very peak of it, I don't know if you noticed, but there's some little things sticking up there. Um, those are crosses, and uh, this little mountain is called Cross Peak. But I have to tell you, when I moved here in 1993, I didn't know that it was called Cross Peak. I didn't know that it had a name at all. But to me, it looked like Sleepy Monkey Mountain. And uh, I'll show you what I mean by that. So here's a little sleeping monkey. And so you can kind of see the the chin and the head on the left-hand side and a big round tummy and then on the right-hand side kind of sloping down, you can see the feet there. So that's a little bit of my patternicity. Um, 
So this is the, the first slide that I put up that has a representation of the kind of stars that you can see in a really dark sky. I mean, this would be really, really dark. Um, something like um, going out to Great Basin National Park, or uh, I can remember the first time that I climbed Mount Shasta. I got up at uh, two o'clock in the morning, was about halfway up at around uh, 12,000 feet, I think, and uh, got out of my tent. And I have to tell you, I was completely lost with all those stars. And this right here, this is the image of uh, the mother with a young infant looking at her and starting to pattern that face. And one of the first things we do is learn how to recognize our parents' face. And this right here, this is the face on Mars. And uh, like I mentioned, honestly, it's just a mound that when the light hits it at a certain angle, it kind of makes a face. And, um, you know, we're really good at that. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this kind of um, um, uh, visualization of something, but you're driving down the road in a car and you see this dead dog on the side of the road just, just up on the right. And as you get a little bit closer, you notice that it's just somebody's coat that happened to be laying down on, on the ground. Pretty amazing what our minds can do. And this right here, this is Sleepy Monkey Mountain that I was talking about. This is actually Cross Peak. And um, this is kind of the monkey shape of it. So you see the chin and the head on the left-hand side and the big fat belly in the middle and then the sloping belly that goes down to the feet. So I said I was gonna get back to constellations. So constellations are uh, patterns in the sky uh, that are designated as actually kind of like locations in the sky, let's say like, um, the zodiac, you know, in the zodiac uh, in the area where the uh, the planets travel through uh, the sky called the ecliptic. Uh, we've got 12 constellations, Aries, Aquarius, Cancer, uh, Capricornus, uh, Gemini, Leo, Libra, Pisces, Sagittarius, Scorpius, Taurus, and Virgo that mark out that area of the sky. But um, up above to the north and down to the south, back in uh, 150 uh, AD, this particular guy uh, is called Ptolemy. Uh, he came up with, um, with a mathematical um, uh, treatise that uh, was called the Al Almagest. And in the Almagest, he compiled a list of 48 constellations. Um, they did, the list didn't actually go all that far back in time, but established a baseline of constellation shapes in the sky and areas of the sky associated with those shapes. Um, you know, and honestly, that's, that's really important um, because uh, I, I kind of call the constellation signposts in the sky. It's kind of a way to find your way around. And you know, in a couple of minutes, we're going to. Uh, talk about that a little bit more, but uh, in um, 1992, the International Ast Astronomical Union um, got involved with trying to fill up the spaces in the sky that weren't designated as constellations and actually came up with 88. Uh, part of the problem was that uh, most of the constellations that Ptolemy came up with were uh, in the northern hemisphere. It didn't it, From the latitude that he was at, he didn't really see much of the southern sky. And so um, by the uh, 20th century, of course, you know, we had seen quite a bit of the southern sky. And so they actually ended up filling up the whole sky with constellations. Um, that that is very very helpful um you know right now uh let's say uh, you know we have a comet called Com comet neowise that's in the sky it's kind of fading or whatever but uh, one way to generally describe where the comet is is say well you know it's in the constellation of ursa major and um 
that it is. It is actually fading quite a bit. Hopefully, um, some of you were able to see Comet Wise before it faded out this much because it's actually really beautiful a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the, the constellations are used um, as signposts in the sky, but they're also used to um, uh, carry on stories, let's say, um, stories of creation, um, stories of uh, mythology. Um, the um, constellation of um, Ursa Major, shown here on the left side of your screen, as stars connected with um, lines showing the, the basic shape of the constellation without the figure, um, it covers a pretty large area of the sky. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see that, um, you know, it's the shape of a bear. So Ursa Major is the greater bear. And uh, the shape of the uh, Big Dipper within the Ursa Major constellation is actually called an asterism. So it's a shape that we recognize in the sky and is probably one of the most recognizable shapes in the sky for people in the Northern Hemisphere. In fact, um, I have visitors from honestly all over the world uh, that come up to the Cosmonarium at North Star. And probably the most common question when we get out is, are we going to see the Big Dipper? Yeah. But anyway, so the Big Dipper is a, a very prominent constellation in the sky. It's also a constellation that um, is um, uh, in, a, in a position close to the, what's called the North Celestial Pole, where it doesn't um, completely set beyond the horizon um, in, at our latitude. In fact, um, here, here the, um, the shape of the con constellation is, is shown as a, as a big bear, where you have the, the bucket of the Big Dipper as the back of the bear, and then the handle of the Big Dipper is actually a tail. Um, you know, that's true for a lot of representations of, of this particular group of stars, but um, actually some uh, people look at the uh, Ursa Major constellation and, and call it a plow. It looks like a plow to them. And then it just so happens that um, just off to uh, the side of um, the Big Dipper constellation, if you follow the handle kind of curving around, you can find a really bright star called Arcturus. It is only about maybe 36 light years away, but it's a um, red giant star, very bright. It's the brightest star of uh, Bootes. The Bootes sometimes is called um, uh, the herdsman, but sometimes it's called the, the plowman. So the guy that's working the, the earth with, with the Big Dipper um, as a plow. Um, uh, Native American Indians uh, look at the uh, it, the Ursa Major constellation and also see it as uh, a bear, but the bear is actually only the four stars of the bucket of the Big Dipper. The other three stars in the handle are actually uh, hunters that are following the bear. And uh, the story goes that as the um, seasons progress and the Big Dipper becomes lower in the horizon, uh, the handle actually uh, gets down into um, into the horizon, and um, the leaves turn um, red in the um, in the winter months or the fall months, and that's because uh, well they wounded the bear. So it was kind of interesting that um, we have these constellation shapes that, like I said, are standardized for modern constellations by the International um, Astronomical Union, but there's a lot of different cultures on the planet that see these patterns and see them as something else. And then just looking at the Ursa Major as uh, the Big Dipper, um, one really important thing, and a lot of you may know this, but is to use the Big Dipper to find where Polaris is. 
And uh, going back to what I was saying about being up on Mount Shasta, getting out of my tent at two o'clock in the morning with my binoculars to do some stargazing, I looked up and honestly, I was lost. There's so many stars. You know, uh, in Reno, Nevada, where I live, um, the, the sky isn't all that polluted, but it's polluted enough that uh, you don't see as many stars as you would see in that first slide that I put up there. Um, so that the stars of the Big Dipper actually show up a lot, a lot easier because they are all fairly bright stars. But anyway, so I looked around for the Big Dipper for a while and finally found it because I knew basically where North was. And if you follow um, the stars on the end of the uh, bucket, like shown here, and draw a line out to the next brightest star, that star right there is Polaris. And uh, Polaris is at the tip of the uh, Little Dipper. And the Little Dipper, honestly, is rather disappointing because its stars are not near as bright as the stars in the Big Dipper and much, much uh, more difficult to, to pick out and see the, the shape of, of the Dipper. But anyways, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to get yourself oriented in the sky. And so once you go out to find the Big Dipper, to find the, the North Star, then you can wander around, like I said, and find other constellations like, you know, following the, uh, the handle of the Big Dipper and kind of a general arc out to Arcturus and you can find uh, the, the herdsmen or Bootes. And um, one of my favorite things to do is once I find the Big Dipper and I know where North is, I'll stand uh, facing North and this time of year look up towards the, v the zenith, which the zenith would be straight up uh, above you and look for a bright star. And um, that bright star up there is called Vega. And uh, Vega is about 25 light years away. Uh, it's actually, it's the star that Jodie Foster went to in the movie Contact. But it's also the brightest star of the constellation of Lyra, the harp. And um, the stories go that the harp, honestly, the music of it was so beautiful that it even would even swoon uh, inanimate objects like rocks and lakes and mountains and things like that. And uh, from that bright star there, if you uh, go off to the left and down a little bit, then there's another star, not quite as bright as Vega, but it's called Deneb. And uh, Deneb is the brightest star in the constellation of right here. It's called the Northern Cross, and I put that up on purpose because it's it's fairly easy to recognize it as a, a cross, but it's actually called Cygnus the Swan. And Cygnus the Swan kind of looks like this. So imagine that uh, Deneb is the tail of the swan. And way over on the other end of that horizontal line there, the star um, that's not quite as bright as Deneb is called um, Albrorio. And Albrorio is actually an old Arabic word that means beak of the hen. And so that's actually the beak of the swan. And then if you go back where the cross is made, that's actually the wings. And this particular diagram doesn't really show it as grandiose as it is uh, because the wings actually extend out a little farther on each side. And I have to tell you that um, Cygnus the Swan, honestly, is my favorite summer constellation. And, and the reason for that is that uh, if, you, if you go out tonight, well, tonight's not a good night because you have a uh, waxing gibbous moon out there. This is going to be pretty bright. But wait, um, you know, for another week or so and go out, find Deneb, find Cygnus the Swan in a dark area, and you'll notice the Cygnus the Swan is flying through the Milky Way because the Milky Way goes right through that area of the sky. So we have Vega and Deneb. And then if you go 
down further to the horizon and way over to the right, there's another bright star there. And that bright star is called Altair. Um, Altair um, is the brightest star of the constellation Aquila, which is the eagle. And uh, the eagle actually was known to uh, hold the thunderbolts that uh, Zeus would use. Uh, in fact, there's a story about um, Cygnus the swan that um, the reason that uh, Cygnus um, the swan is up there is because um, there was the, um, the son of Helios uh, wanted to uh, take the, um, um, the sun's uh, chariot across the sky. And um, they got in that and um, didn't do a very good job handling it. It went out of control and Zeus had to take one of the lightning bolts and destroy it and actually uh, killed Cygnus. And um, he was later um, with, with some sympathy associated with the event put up in the sky uh, as Cygnus the swan. Uh, then um, back to Altar, I wanted to mention that uh, Altair, uh, the star itself is uh, about 16 light years away. And it's fairly bright. It's about as bright as Deneb is. Uh, and neither one of those are as bright as Vega. But Vega's, uh, Vega's a fairly good sized star, very, very bright. It's 25 light years away. It's brighter than Altair. But Deneb is about 1,500 light years away. And it's almost as bright as the others. So could you imagine, you know, how big and bright a star uh, Deneb is? So, anyways, it's a it's a great place to find some terrific constellations in the summer triangle, Deneb, Vega, and Altair, uh, and then also take a look at comparisons of the brightness of stars related to their to their distance. So, um, where am I? Let's see. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, so, anyways, um, the constellations themselves can be a lot of fun to um, to, to learn about. Uh, but, uh, like I was saying, I kind of see them as signposts in the, in the sky. They're, they have interesting stories associated with them. And there's some, there's some really nice books out there. I brought two books to, uh, to share. This one right here is called The Night Sky Atlas. And this is by Robin uh, Siegel. Um, it's a beautiful book. And this is, let's say, for younger constellation viewers, uh, maybe uh, 10, or, 10 or under, something like that. But there's a lot of information here. There's some um, star charts, and some of the star charts uh, have overlays um, on the star chart. So you can uh, overlay a constellation shape over the star um, patterns that they're showing in the, uh, in the pictures of the stars. And then also there's this one right here, um, Constellations uh, by Kyle uh, Sparrow. And this right here, this is an excellent adult book. Uh, I mean, this is honestly, this is a great reference book. You know, when, you know, we can find all this information, honestly, on the internet, if you want to search around or whatever, but this is compiled rather nicely. And it's actually very readable. So if you want to go through the different chapters and whatever, it will help give you some understanding of, um, you know, what, what's out there, what you're actually seeing, but then constellation stories as well. Um, so we, uh, we had a contest associated with this little talk. Um, and honestly, we didn't have a lot of entries, but uh, we do have a winner. And the, the winner is uh, actually going to receive this telescope behind me. It's a, uh, a Celestron Explorer telescope but it has a really neat little adapter that allows you to put a cell phone on it, load up an app, and the app will actually help you point the telescope around to different objects in the sky. Like tonight, if you had the scope, 
In fact, you can see this with the naked eye tonight, but if when you go out, uh, the moon's going to be out there, and so it's a waxing gibbous moon. So it's going to be pretty bright. But off to the left side of it, there's a bright star there. That's Jupiter. And a little bit farther off to the left, not quite as bright, is um, the planet Saturn. So if you had this telescope, you you could see that. So I, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to go back to our share view and uh, show you what the... Um, what the constellation looks like that won the telescope. And the idea behind the contest was um, to come up with a, uh, a constellation and a story associated with it. So this is the constellation. So the, the stars that are shown in the handout there represent the stars you can see from the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, the, uh, the little girl that won this, her, her name is Sheelan, and I, I have her email, so I will contact her. Uh, she's 11 years old, and I would like to read the story associated with the, what she called the disappearing rabbit constellation. One night in the trailer behind the circus tent, a rabbit and a magician were practicing for the nightly show. As they were practicing, one of the pigeons escaped out of the window, the rabbit ran after the pigeon. The pigeon flew up to perch on the circus tent, and the rabbit scrambled to its sides after it. As the rabbit climbed up, he was amazed by the beautiful stars. He wanted to see them very much. He climbed up farther until he came to the pigeon. He had an idea. He asked the pigeon, would you be able to fly to the stars? The pigeon answered, I believe I could. The rabbit became very excited, but he heard the magician calling, I must go, said the rabbit, and he started climbing down. The pigeon flew after him. The rabbit jumped into his hat, and the pigeon flew into her cage. As the show started, they could hear the crowd cheering and the magician whispering magic words. Finally, the magician was ready to perform the disappearing rabbit trick. The rabbit jumped into the hat on the table. The magician waved his wand and said a few words. The rabbit disappeared and ended up underneath the table. We can quickly run out of the tent when I take you, and I can take you to the stars, said the pigeon. So they darted out from underneath the table while nobody was looking. Rabbit jumped into the pigeon's back, and almost immediately they were in the air. The rabbit was amazed that the pigeon flew higher and higher in the sky. Soon they were flying around the stars. It was beautiful. The stars danced beautiful dances, twinkled brightly and created shapes of wonderful animals. The rabbit wondered if it might be able to say, stay. I think I'd like to stay here, said the rabbit. What a wonderful idea, said the pigeon. I will, said the rabbit. The pigeon flapped its wings and flew away. She thought she saw the shape of the rabbit and the stars that night. Meanwhile, back at the circus, the magician said, now I will make the rabbit come back. He waved the magic words, held out the hat for everyone to see. In the hat was the pigeon. And uh, I thought that was such a terrific little story. Um, <clears throat> So uh, congratulations, uh, Sheelan. Uh, like I mentioned, if you're here, uh, I will contact you via email and uh, really appreciate your entry. And then to all the rest of you, um, I, I don't know, there might be some questions, but I wanna thank you for joining in and uh, having the interest in uh, you know, what you can see up in the night sky. So uh, are, there, are there any questions? Well, thank you so much, Tony. That was a great program. And congratulations to the um, winner of the telescope. That was a great, um, great story of the constellation of the, um, the rabbit. I have a question. What is a good app that you could recommend for us novice astronomers that might want to get our feet wet looking at the constellations? Oh, I'm glad you asked that because, you know, honestly, the astronomy apps are awesome. I really encourage people to use them. 
it's like self-discovery when you're out underneath the skies. But uh, uh, one uh, great, really great app is called Sky Portal. It's free. Uh, there is another app that is called Starwalk, which is free. And uh, if you want to get something that's a little bit more sophisticated, that uh, costs about um, eight or nine dollars, is uh, Sky Safari. But those three right there are a bit. But the two, you know, I would I would start out if you don't have one, start out with one of the free ones like Sky Portal, and they're pretty amazing. You know, they have uh, audio files in there. So if you put your finger on an object and you want to find out about it, it'll talk to you and tell you about it. Just like being with Tony. Wow. <laughs> Technology is awesome. Um, here's another question. How do constellations become official? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of why I brought up Ptolemy, uh, because, um, you know, in the um, days of, let's say, the Babylonians, when uh, constellations were, were first recorded, or uh, in the early, uh, you know, days of Chinese uh, viewing the skies and whatever, uh, there were a lot of uh, kind of local stories about things, but it um, really wasn't an official constellation. And so um, what uh, Ptolemy did back in 150 AD is uh, he put together a list of 48 constellations and said, hey, so these are the constellations, at least in the, that area uh, of Europe or whatever, and then later on in the, in the Western world or whatever, they were accepted as official constellations. And then the International Astronomical Union, which is actually the um, entity that is responsible for naming things like stars or craters on the moon, whatever, they got into the task and then came up with actually 88 constellations. So that's, that's how it's done. Great. Another question is, what is the brightest star in the constellation Draco, Draco, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. D R A C O, Draco. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to look that one up for you. <laughs> but, yeah, Draco is actually really neat. It's a really uh, cool constellation because it's actually right in between uh, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, and it, it kind of it, its long sinuous body kind of goes through that area of space in between those uh, two asterisms and then kind of circles around, and then it has a head that is just below Hercules. And Hercules actually is, has his club lifted up and getting ready to smack the dragon in the head and, you know, do, do him in. It was one of Hercules' great feats. But uh, the brightest star, what I would suggest, um, uh, you can send me an email, uh, tony at tahostartours.com. I'll look that up for you and, and send that to you. Or you could try one of those star apps. All right, another um, question. Um, what's a good telescope that you could recommend to look at planets? Oh, well, you know, for a star telescope, something like this actually is a great way to go. Uh, this, this telescope right here, it's 80 millimeters. It's a refracting telescope, so it has a lens kind of like a ship's telescope, and it doesn't have a mirror in it. It's not a reflecting telescope. Uh, very easy to put together and maneuver and whatever, but it works really well for planetary observations and uh, also lunar observations as well. So I would suggest, I mean, I honestly, I like Celestron telescopes, um, but if you get something, don't get it from a department store. Um, you know, go, go online and get it from somebody uh, that, that sells telescopes specifically. Uh, like I said, Celestron's a good product. This one costs uh, $170. And like I said, it also comes with that cell phone adapter. So even if you don't know where anything is in the sky, you just load up that app and it will point you to where you wanna go. Great tips. Um, another question, um, this person lives in Reno and they're asking, um, where's a good place um, that you recommend in the Reno area to go view stars? Place that maybe is not too far 
Yeah, you know, a really great place is uh, Little Washoe Lake. Little Washoe Lake. So um, uh, you're um, far enough away from, from Reno uh, that the light dome from Reno doesn't bother you too much there. And then a lot of the really cool objects, is, especially, well, even in the winter, winter and summer, are kind of towards the south. So you're looking out towards Carson City. Carson City doesn't have much of a light dome. So it's a actually pretty darn dark there. Uh, there's another place that I really like. It, it, it's a little farther to go to, but uh, Mount Rose Meadows at night, the, the, the campground is actually closed. But what I do is I'll go up and there's kind of a parking area off the highway there. And I'll just take my telescope out and just walk down the side of the hill just a little bit so you are, are um, <clears throat> uh, sh shading yourself from the headlights that, that come by. And that's actually much better, but it's a lot further to go. Um, and thirdly, um, if you uh, want to drive out towards Red Rock, so you're going north from Reno, uh, you drive out there, there's, um, there's a lot of public land out there, and you can um, pick a spot where you can drive off on one of those little dirt roads and um, stop and um, view the stars. In fact, you know, we're going to have the Perseid meteor shower. Actually, the peak is going to be the 11th, 12th, and 13th. And uh, gosh, about five years ago, I had a wonderful experience going out with my daughter and um, uh, amateur astronomer by the name of Jesse Huntsman. We just laid out on the on the ground, on the blanket out there for hours, just looking up and watching those beautiful um, meteors. So, so those are three good places that are easy to get to. Excellent. Well, I don't see any other questions. So I think we'll go ahead and close this program out. Again, a huge thank you for everyone um, for joining us in this late night program. I know I'm going to go take a look out at the stars when I leave tonight and see what I can see. Um, thank you so much, Tony, for joining us and for hosting um, the, um, the contest. That was great. And um, thank you, everyone. Again, thank you to friends for making this program possible. And we'll see you all later. Have a good night.